If you're thinking about buying an investment property out of state, there's a few things that you need to be aware of. But in this video, I'm going to share with you my experience and some of the things I wish I would have done a little more due diligence on so that way you don't make the same mistakes and have the same headaches that I've been having to deal with. If this is the first time you're checking out my channel, my name is Sean Oihara. I'm an area manager with Geneva Financial, helping you get your mortgage right. You can hit the description below. There's links to more information, as well as if you need a second opinion on your refinance or purchase, you can always shoot me an email and my team and I would be happy happy to take a look at that for you. Now, I wanted to talk about some long distance investing or purchasing an investment property in another state. This is becoming more and more popular because a lot of folks, depending on where you live, you may be priced out of your market uh, in terms of rental properties, because typically when you buy an investment property, you're looking at at least 25 to maybe even 30, if not more percent down in order to buy a rental. Now, it depends on what your overall goal is. Now, you can put as little as probably 20% down, but you're probably not going to cash flow in any market that's out there, especially where interest rates are today. So if you're looking at generating some sort of cash flow, you probably want to put more money down. And this is why as an investor, it really depends on what your overall goal is. For example, for myself, when I was buying some of my rental properties a few years ago, my number one thing was cash flow. I obviously timed it well. I bought when rates were in the twos. So all my investment properties have interest rates under 3% right now. And we're cash flowing on every single one of them, which is great. And that was the goal. Now I have looked at deals in in Florida and California. But a lot of times when you're looking at deals in those states, you may not get the cash flow that you desire, depending on the type of property you're buying, whether you're buying a single family or maybe even a multi unit property. Now with a multi unit, you may have a higher chance to get some cash flow versus a single family rental. So I decided to stay away from those properties. And I wanted to focus on the cash flow, which led me to properties over in the Midwest. Now, the one thing I wish I would have done a little more due diligence on is with a property manager. Now I've hired a property manager to take care of the properties that I own. I have several in Arkansas and we have one over in Wisconsin. Now I'm going to talk about the ones in Arkansas because that's where I've had the most headache. So when I acquired these homes, they were already managed by a property manager. So I just left it there just for the convenience. And I just assumed that was just an easier thing for me to do. Never really did any research. I just kind of went with the flow and you know, it worked out for the time being. There's been a few things that have come up that have been a sore subject for me. And this is why I wanted to shoot this video. I just to help you folks out. So what I've had over the last call it six months is few of these properties have turned over and now we've had new tenants come in. Now, one of the things that really annoys me is what they call a rent ready bid. So essentially when the tenant moves out, they'll have someone go into the house and they'll look at all the items that needs to be fixed, repaired. And then from there, you can either pay the amount or ask them for a second opinion and move forward with the repairs. Now with this one scenario that literally is happening as I'm talking to you right now and I'm doing this video is that we had a rent ready bid come back and it was about $6,400. The thing I didn't like about the bid was that the bid wasn't itemized. So they literally gave me a spreadsheet and it just said the items that were being fixed, like the bathroom, the flooring, the paint, the baseboards, and they just gave me a dollar figure. So I asked the property manager, I said, look, can you give me a second bid? And their response to me was, you know, Sean, we always give our clients the best bid first. I said, that's fine. Well, give me, I still want to see at least a second option so I can compare that. So they gave me another option. They had someone else go out to the house, give me another bid. And you won't believe what they came back with. They came back with a bid of about $3,100, nearly half of what they initially quoted me. So now this really annoyed me and this really pissed me off, thus me shooting this video. So with that rent ready bid, now I was ready to move forward at that price. But then I started to ask them, I said, well, what items were left off the first bid from the second bid? Because they do everything through this portal. When they sent the second bid over, they essentially removed what the first bid was. So I couldn't even compare the two. Thus, back to my point of one thing you should always ask for if you're doing a rent ready bid is get it itemized out. That way you can actually see what the cost is per line item, which they never did that. And that's why I asked for it because everything was lumped into one total cost, which is fine. But for me, I want to know what are we spending money on? If it's the bathroom countertops, how much does that cost? If it's the baseboards, how much does that cost? The flooring, the paint, whatever they wanted to fix, tell me what that is. Now, the bid ended up going to $3,100. I sent money in. In. Come to find out that contractor, I guess it took a week. They never did anything on the job. So the property manager fired them. And now we're back to bid number one at $6,400. But I had a conversation with one of the owners of the company and I asked him, I said, you know, why am I being charged all this? And what are these items? And I want them itemized out so I can really determine what do I really want to spend money on? Because I don't necessarily have to repair everything that's in the house or I have to fix everything that's in there. And we had a conversation. So 
So he went through the bids. He had some additional photos that weren't sent to me. And he said some of the items didn't necessarily need to be replaced. And I'll tell you, for example, they wanted to replace the bathroom fixtures. Now he said, those are perfectly fine. We didn't need to replace them. I mean, we could certainly use them again. So it's little things like that. When you're not there locally in the city where you can drive to the house, you can look at the things that need to be done. I'm trusting the property manager to do what's right. Now to do what's right could mean what's right for them, or it could mean what's right for me as an investor, as a client of theirs. But this is where that trust has got to be so paramount because if it's not, you start to get really annoyed. Like I've been getting annoyed with these guys because they just haven't been giving me what I feel is the straight story. So after the conversation with the owner, we go through the bids and we basically get the number down to about $3,000. So that's totally fine. There's a few things, for example, that I chose not to repair, which is this big scratch and the laminate in the master bedroom and the primary bedroom. And he said, you know what? It's sort of in the middle of the room. So most people will probably put a rug down and they're probably going to put their bed over it. And he said, it shouldn't be an issue. However, if we get a tenant that's ready to sign a lease and it's a big enough problem for them, then, you know, we'll go ahead and replace it. But that cost alone was about a thousand dollars worth of the bid. So that saved me quite a bit of money. And again, the property management company could say, well, let's just fix it. Let's do this, fix this, fix the bathroom, fix the fixtures, get all new everything just to get somebody else into the house. And that wasn't necessarily needed. So when you're doing long distance investing, you need to make sure that that property manager is going to do what's right for you. You want to make sure that obviously the house is livable and there's nothing that the tenant's going to be complaining about. But at the same time, you don't want to over improve the property. And I can tell you over the last couple of years, I've had a few homes that we've had to evict people from. We've also had, as some of you know, lightning hit one of my houses, burnt it down. And we've had some tenants that they just never chose to renew the lease. Now, initially, when we were doing some of these properties, you think as a landlord, like, hey, let's install nicer appliances, nicer finishes, nicer everything. Maybe the tenant's going to appreciate it. And I can tell you from what I've seen so far, in most cases, the tenants don't care. When they move out of that house, they are tearing this thing apart. They're breaking things and just unnecessary, in my opinion, repairs that shouldn't necessarily need to be done if they truly cared about the property. We're having to fix. So lesson learned, don't over improve the property, get it to a livable standard and make it decent for them. But definitely don't go out of your way thinking that doing nicer things is going to make them feel some type of way about the property because so far that has not been the case. And I know that may be a generalized statement and some of you may be renters and you take care of your properties and hey, that's more props to you. And I wish more people would do that. But I think more people fall to the other side. And when they move out, you know, there's nicks and there's holes and there's scratches. I mean, who breaks a bathroom countertop? How hard is that to do? And what are you doing even in the bathroom to break it? So the one thing I would definitely recommend is making sure that you probably interview a few property managers, look them up online, look at their reviews. Do they have social media? Do they have a Google review page or maybe even Facebook and kind of see what maybe some of the tenants are saying, but maybe even other landlords to see what type of feedback are you getting? Because that may give you an initial sign of maybe their customer service, maybe their responsiveness. I did start to poke around just to kind of see who else is available in the Arkansas area where I have a few of these properties. And I can tell you this, I went to a few websites, put my information in, say, hey, I'm looking for a property manager. I've got three properties. Can you help me? There are about two companies that didn't even return my call. So right off the bat, there you go. Customer service sucks. So imagine you have a property with them and you can't even get a response back as far as repairs or, hey, we need to evict the tenant or whatever it is. To me, customer service is number one. You have to return calls. You have to return emails in a timely fashion. If you can't even do that, then I don't even know how you're in business. And I think the rent ready bid to me thing that that's another critical piece, because if I'm not there, if I can't see the items that need to be fixed and I'm relying on you to take photos or send me information, obviously you can be selective of what you show me. You can be selective of what you you're willing to disclose to me as well. So make sure you address those things. And I wish I would have done that a little better because in my Milwaukee house, we've had no issues, knock on wood. And that property management company has been fantastic to work with. They're always ahead of the curve. They're always giving me information like, hey, the lease is going to expire in three months. What do you want to do with the rent? How do we want to address that? You know, if there's items that have to be fixed, they're very proactive about everything. And to me, the experience that I've had is this total night and day from one company to the next. And as a long distance investor, that can make or break your rental. Because if there's repairs that are being neglected, if they're just slow to respond, or maybe they're bad at marketing the property, it could sit vacant for a longer period of time. And then of course, you're having to still make that mortgage payment. So some of those things, I really wish that I would have looked 
looked into a little better, but hopefully you don't make the same mistakes or maybe you've experienced some of these same frustrations that I have. If you're an investor, comment below, maybe with some of your horror stories and we can share in each other's pain together. But if you're thinking about buying some rental property, I hope this helps you kind of figure out maybe your game plan to be able to acquire some homes. And if you need some financing on those homes, don't forget my team and I can always get you qualified and help you get your financing. Subscribe to this video if you found this helpful. Thanks for watching and I'll see you on the next one.